how each Egyptian plague was connected to defeating an Egyptian god. In the ancient land of Egypt, where mighty pyramids touched the sky and the Nile River brought life, the mighty power of God was shown. It was a battle between God and many gods. God appeared to Moses in a burning bush that was not consumed by fire. God said to Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Exodus chapter 3 verse 7. God then tasked Moses to return to Egypt, to lead the Israelites out of slavery, and into a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses was hesitant, feeling inadequate, but God assured him of his presence and power. Moses, along with his brother Aaron, went to Pharaoh and said, Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, so that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh refused and instead increased the Israelites' workload, causing them great suffering. Despite Pharaoh's stubbornness, God promised to deliver the Israelites. He said, Exodus chapter 3, verse 20, So I will reach out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. This sets the stage for the Ten Plagues, which were not just disasters, but signs of God's power and a challenge to the Egyptian gods and Pharaoh's authority. So before the plagues, there was a story of oppression, a call for deliverance, and a confrontation between Moses and Pharaoh, supported by a sacred promise from God to free the Israelites. This story leads directly into the dramatic events of the Ten Plagues in Egypt. Connection to the Egyptian Gods Number 1. Water Turned to Blood God targeted Happy, the god of the Nile. Happy was believed to be the god of the Nile in ancient Egyptian mythology, deeply revered as he was associated with the yearly flooding of the Nile River. According to their belief, flooding was crucial as it brought fertile soil to the banks of the Nile, making it possible for the Egyptians to grow crops. Happy was not just a god of water, but also a symbol of fertility and prosperity. He was often depicted as a man with a large belly, symbolizing abundance, and sometimes with aquatic plants around him, representing the life-giving qualities of the Nile. This resulted in the links of the Nile River to the believed source of Egypt's fertility and life. When God turned the Nile's water to blood, it was not only a direct attack on Happy, but also on the lifeblood of Egypt itself. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He lifted up the staff and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water of the Nile turned to blood. Exodus chapter 7, verses 20 through 21. The story of the first plague of Egypt is a story about how God sent a terrible disaster to Egypt to free the Israelites from slavery. In the land of Egypt, the Israelites were slaves, and Moses was chosen by God to lead them to freedom. But Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, refused to let them go. So God decided to show his power to convince Pharaoh. God told Moses, Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the water and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go, so that they may worship me. Exodus chapter 7 verses 15 through 16. But Pharaoh didn't listen. Then God gave Moses the power to perform a miracle. He told Moses to take his staff and stretch out his hand over the waters of Egypt, including the Nile River, the canals, the ponds, and all their reservoirs, and turn them to blood. 
This was a way to prove that the God of Israel was stronger than the Egyptian gods and goddesses, especially those connected to the Nile. Moses did as God commanded. He lifted his staff, and all the water in Egypt turned into blood. The fish in the river died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians couldn't drink its water. This was the first of the ten plagues that God sent upon Egypt to free the Israelites. Despite this scary event, Pharaoh's heart remained hard, and he still refused to let the Israelites go. So this was just the beginning of the plagues that would come upon Egypt. Number 2. Frogs God targeted Heket, the frog-headed goddess of fertility. Heket was another ancient Egyptian goddess God targeted during the plague. She is often depicted with the head of a frog. She was considered the goddess of fertility and childbirth. In Egyptian mythology, frogs were symbols of life and fertility because of their ability to lay hundreds of eggs. Heket was thus respected as a symbol of the beginning of life and was believed to have powers that could protect and guide women during childbirth. Now connecting Heket to the second plague of Egypt. The story of the second plague starts when Pharaoh still refuses to let the Israelite slaves go free. God then instructs Moses to warn Pharaoh of the consequences. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says, let my people go, so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will plague your whole country with frogs. Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 through 2. Aaron, Moses' brother, stretches his hand over the waters of Egypt, and frogs swarm the land. Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. Exodus chapter 8, verse 6. The significance of this plague, particularly in the context of Heket, lies in its symbolic challenge. By sending a plague of frogs, God was directly challenging the belief in Heket's power and authority. The Egyptians, who saw frogs as symbols of fertility and blessings under Heket's patronage, were now overwhelmed by these same creatures turning into a curse covering their land, entering their homes, and disrupting their lives. The plague demonstrated that the God of Israel had power over the very symbols of life and fertility that the Egyptians looked up to. It was a powerful message to Pharaoh and the Egyptians that their gods like Heken had no power against the will of the God of Israel. Despite this clear sign, Pharaoh's heart remained hardened and he did not let the Israelites go, leading to further plagues. The river shall swarm with frogs, and they shall come into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed. Exodus chapter 8 verses 2 through 4. The frogs were everywhere, in houses, bedrooms, on people, in ovens, and even in the kneading bowls used for making bread. It was a massive invasion of frogs, making life very difficult for the Egyptians. Pharaoh, troubled by this plague, called Moses and Aaron and asked them to pray to God to take the frogs away. He promised that he would let the Israelites go if the frogs were removed. The Bible says, And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. Exodus chapter 8, verse 8. Moses prayed to God, and God did as Moses asked. The frogs died out in the houses, courtyards, and fields. The Egyptians had to pile up the dead frogs in heaps, and the land smelled terrible. Once the frogs were gone, Pharaoh changed his mind and didn't let the Israelites go. This led to more plagues as a consequence of his stubbornness. This story of the second plague 
is about how God used natural creatures like frogs in extraordinary numbers to demonstrate his power and to convince Pharaoh to free the Israelites from slavery. Number three, gnats or lice. Geb was an important deity in ancient Egyptian mythology, respected as the god of the earth. He was often depicted as a man lying beneath the sky goddess, Nut, representing the earth. Geb was not just the god of the physical earth, but also had a role in agriculture, fertility, and the underworld. He was seen as a father figure to plants and crops, and it was believed that earthquakes were his laughter. Now, relating Geb to the third plague of Egypt from the Bible, we see a significant connection. The third plague directly confronts Geb's domain. God instructs Moses and Aaron to confront Pharaoh again after he refuses to let the Israelites go. This time, the plague involves the very earth that Geb is supposed to rule. God tells Moses to command Aaron to stretch out his staff and strike the dust of the ground. Aaron does as commanded, and something extraordinary happens. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 8 verses 16 through 17. When Aaron strikes the ground, the dust transforms into gnats or lice. This sudden change from dust to swarming insects is a direct challenge to Geb. It shows that the God of Israel has power over the earth, which is Geb's realm, turning it into a source of discomfort instead of life and growth. The Egyptian magicians, who could mimic the previous plagues, tried to produce gnats themselves but fail. Realizing the magnitude of what has happened, they say to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. Exodus chapter 8 verse 19. However, Pharaoh's heart remains hardened, and he does not heed their words or the sign of power from the God of Israel. This third plague is significant because it's not just a demonstration of God's power over the natural world, but it's also a symbolic defeat of Geb, the Egyptian god of the earth. The inability of the Egyptian magicians to replicate this plague further emphasizes the unique and supreme power of the God of Israel. The plague of gnats is more than just a nuisance. It's a display of God's power, showing that he controls even the smallest elements of creation. The Egyptians, who worship many gods, are showing that their gods are powerless against the God of Israel. Number four, flies. Kepri is an ancient Egyptian god often associated with creation, the movement of the sun, and rebirth. His name is linked to the Egyptian word Kepri, meaning to develop or to come into being. Kepri is usually depicted as a scarab beetle, or as a man with a scarab for a head, symbolizing creation and rebirth. In Egyptian mythology, Scarab beetles roll dung into balls, from which they emerge, symbolizing new life and regeneration. Kepri was believed to roll the sun across the sky each day, expressing the idea of the rising sun and renewal each morning. Now, relating Kepri to the fourth plague of Egypt. The fourth plague, described in the Bible in the book of Exodus, involves a swarm of flies. This plague came after Pharaoh again refused to let the Israelite people go. The story begins with God instructing Moses to rise early in the morning, confront Pharaoh, and warn him of the coming plague. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, 
he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thy houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereon they are. Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 21. Unlike the previous plagues, where the Israelites in the land of Goshen also suffered, this time God makes a distinction. The land of Goshen, where the Israelites live, is spared, emphasizing that God is protecting his people. This distinction is significant and is highlighted in Exodus chapter 8, verses 22 through 23. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell. The no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. The plague of flies is a direct challenge to the Egyptian god, Kepri. By sending a plague of flies, God is showing his power over Kepri, the god of creation and rebirth, symbolized by the scarab beetle. The swarm of flies, a pest and a nuisance, stands in stark contrast to the revered scarab, undermining the power and authority of Kepri in the eyes of the Egyptians. Despite the seriousness of the plague, Pharaoh's heart remains hardened, and he continues to refuse to let the Israelite people go. Then God did what he said he would. He sent a huge number of flies all over Egypt. These flies were everywhere, in houses, on people, and all over the land. It was terrible for the Egyptians, but interestingly, the area where the Israelites lived Goshen had no flies at all. This showed that God was protecting his people. Pharaoh, troubled by this plague, called Moses and Aaron. He said, Go sacrifice to your God here in the land. Exodus chapter 8, verse 25. But Moses said it wasn't right to do that in Egypt. So Pharaoh agreed to let the Israelites go into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to their God. However, he asked Moses to pray for the removal of the flies first. Moses prayed to God, and God removed the flies from Egypt. But once the flies were gone, Pharaoh changed his mind again and didn't let the Israelites go. This story from the Bible shows how God was trying to help the Israelites and prove his power to the Egyptians, while Pharaoh kept resisting. Number five, death of livestock. God targeted Hathor, goddess of love and protection, often depicted as a cow. Hathor is a significant deity in ancient Egyptian mythology, known as the goddess of love, beauty, music, and protection. She was a woman with the head of a cow, or a woman wearing a headdress of cow horns and a sun disc. This imagery symbolizes fertility, motherhood, and the nurturing aspects of nature. Hathor was respected not only as a protective goddess, but also as one representing joy and feminine love. She was also associated with the afterlife, providing guidance and protection to the souls entering the next world. Now, relating Hathor to the fifth plague of Egypt, as mentioned in the Bible, gives us a deeper understanding of the symbolism behind this event. In this stage of the story, God continues to demand through Moses that Pharaoh release the Israelites from slavery. When Pharaoh refuses, God warns of a severe consequence a plague that will specifically target the livestock of Egypt. God causes a severe disease to affect all the livestock of the Egyptians. This includes horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep, and goats. 
they all die from the disease. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous moraine, and the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. And there shall nothing die of all that is the children's of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died. But of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. Exodus chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. The death of the livestock was a significant blow to the Egyptian economy and daily life, as these animals were essential for labor, transportation, and agricultural processes. Symbolically, targeting the cattle was a direct challenge to Hathor, the cow goddess, showing the supremacy of the God of Israel over the Egyptian deities. Despite the adverse effect of the plague and its impact on Egypt, Pharaoh's heart remains hardened. He still refuses to let the Israelites go, setting the stage for more plagues to follow. In this context, the fifth plague is not just a physical calamity, but also a symbolic act, demonstrating the powerlessness of Egyptian gods like Hathor in the face of the God of Israel's might. It's a key part of the larger narrative of the Exodus, where each plague serves a specific purpose in challenging Egyptian ideology and showcasing the sovereignty of the God of the Israelites. Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. Exodus chapter 9, verse 7. This story shows how God was demonstrating His power and making it clear that He was protecting the Israelites. Despite the devastating loss of their animals, Pharaoh's stubbornness continued, leading to more plagues. Number 6. Boils Isis in ancient Egyptian mythology is a goddess known for her roles as a healer, protector, and the one who was assumed to bring peace. She was one of the most important and popular deities throughout the history of ancient Egypt. Isis was revered not only as a goddess of medicine and peace, but also as a symbol of magic, motherhood, and fertility. She was often depicted as a caring mother figure, which made her a deity people would turn to in times of trouble, especially for health-related issues. Now, Relating to the Sixth Plague of Egypt The Sixth Plague is narrated in the book of Exodus, chapter 9, verses 8 through 12. It comes after Pharaoh continually refuses to let the Israelites leave Egypt. God instructed Moses and Aaron to grab some ash from a furnace and then have Moses throw it into the air while Pharaoh was watching. The soot becomes fine dust over the land of Egypt and causes intense boils to break out on people and animals throughout the land. And they took ashes of the furnace, and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. Exodus chapter 9 verse 10 This plague is significant for several reasons. First. It is a direct challenge to the Egyptian gods of health and healing, including Isis, who was revered as a goddess of medicine. The inability of Egyptian gods to protect the people from this plague further demonstrated the power of the God of Israel. Second, it's notable that even the Egyptian magicians, who had tried to replicate previous plagues, were afflicted by the boils and could not stand before Moses because of them, as mentioned in Exodus chapter 9, verse 11. Despite this terrible plague, Pharaoh's heart remained hard, and he still refused to let the Israelites go. 
This was part of God's plan to show his power and make his name known in Egypt. The sixth plague, like the other plagues, serves to illustrate the power of God and the futility of opposing his will, as well as the specific challenge to the Egyptian gods, including Isis in her role as a healer. Number seven, Hail. Nut is a key figure in ancient Egyptian mythology, known as the goddess of the sky. She is often depicted as a woman arching over the earth, representing the sky. Nut is considered the mother of the sun, moon, and stars, literally embodying the heavens. Her body was thought to create a protective barrier over the earth. Each morning, Nut gave birth to the sun, which would then travel across her body during the day before being swallowed up at sunset and then reborn the next morning. This imagery reflects the Egyptians' understanding of the day and night cycle. Nut was also seen as a mother figure to several other gods in Egyptian mythology, including Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Her role as a mother to both the celestial bodies and significant deities emphasizes her importance in the Egyptian pantheon. Now, introducing the seventh plague of Egypt in the context of Nut. The seventh plague as described in the Bible in the book of Exodus, is a direct challenge to Nut's domain. In Exodus chapter 9, verses 18 through 26, God tells Moses to stretch out his hand towards the sky so that hail will fall all over Egypt, on people, animals, and plants. Before this plague happened, God warned Pharaoh through Moses Moses told Pharaoh what would happen if he didn't let the Israelites go. This passage reads, Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof even until now. Exodus chapter 9 verse 18. When Moses stretches out his staff, the Lord sends thunder, hail and fire to the earth. This severe hailstorm devastated Egypt, destroying crops, livestock, and even people who were caught outside. The hail is mixed with fire, which would have been particularly terrifying and seen as a sign of divine wrath. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very heavy, such as there had not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Exodus chapter 9 verse 24. This plague is significant because it directly confronts Nut, the goddess of the sky. By controlling the weather to such a catastrophic degree, God demonstrates power over Nut's realm, showing that he is more powerful than the Egyptian deities. Only the land of Goshen where the Israelites lived was safe from this hailstorm. The hailstorm, an unusual and severe weather phenomenon for Egypt, serves as a powerful symbol of this divine challenge. After seeing the devastation, Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron, admitting he had sinned and that the Lord was right. He asked them to pray to God to stop the hail, and he would let the Israelites go. Moses agreed, but once the storm stopped, Pharaoh changed his mind and kept the Israelites in slavery. The seventh plague, like the others, is meant to show Pharaoh and the Egyptians that the God of the Israelites is supreme. Despite the devastation of the plague, Pharaoh's heart remains hardened, leading to further plagues and suffering. This narrative underlines the theme of divine power and judgment that runs through the story of the Exodus. Number 8. Locusts Seth, also known as Set, is a significant figure in ancient Egyptian mythology. He was the god of storms, disorder, violence, and foreigners. Seth was often depicted as a creature with a mysterious head sometimes interpreted as an aardvark, a donkey, 
or a composite of several animals. His character is complex. While he was associated with chaos and was often seen as an antagonist, especially in his conflicts with the god Horus, Seth also played a protective role. He was considered the Lord of the Desert and was invoked for his strength in battles and for defending the sun god Ra from the serpent Apophis during his nightly journey. In the context of the biblical plagues in Egypt, Seth's association with storms is particularly relevant when we introduce the Eighth Plague. The Eighth Plague, as narrated in the Bible in the book of Exodus, involved a massive swarm of locusts. God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and warn him about the next plague. Moses said to Pharaoh, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. Exodus chapter 10, verse 3. Moses warned that if Pharaoh didn't let the Israelites go, God would send a plague of locusts that would cover the land. These locusts would eat everything that was left after the previous plagues, including crops and trees. Pharaoh's officials, seeing the damage from the previous plagues, advised Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. But Pharaoh only agreed to let the men go. Moses and Aaron refused this offer because God had instructed that everyone, including children, women, and animals, should go. God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh and perform miracles, as God has hardened Pharaoh's heart to demonstrate his power, and so that the Israelites will tell their children and grandchildren about God's miracles in Egypt. Since Pharaoh didn't agree to God's terms, God told Moses to stretch out his hand over Egypt. When Moses did this, God sent a wind that brought locusts. These locusts covered the land and devour everything that the previous plagues, like hail, had left. This plague was devastating because it destroyed the food supply. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt. They covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and they did eat every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees, or in the herbs of the field, through all the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. After this devastating plague, Pharaoh calls Moses and Aaron in haste, admitting his sin against God and asking for forgiveness. He requests that they plead with God to remove the locusts. Moses prayed to God, and God changed the wind direction, driving the locusts into the Red Sea. Not a single locust remained in Egypt. But even after this, God made Pharaoh's heart stubborn again, and he did not let the Israelites go. The plague of locusts was not only a demonstration of God's power over nature, but also a direct challenge to the Egyptian god Seth, who was associated with storms. It showed that even the mighty god of storms and disorder was powerless before the god of Israel. The locusts, driven by the wind, which could be seen as an element of Seth's domain, devour everything, leaving the land barren and further weakening Egypt. Number 9. Darkness Ra, also known as Re, was one of the most important deities in ancient Egyptian religion. He was the god of the sun, the source of life, and the creator of all. In Egyptian mythology, Ra was believed to travel across the sky in a solar boat during the day and journey through the underworld at night. He was often depicted as a man with the head of a falcon, crowned with a solar disk and a sacred cobra. 
Ra's significance in Egyptian culture cannot be overstated. He was seen as the king of the gods and the bringer of light, warmth, and growth. In the biblical narrative of the Exodus, the ninth plague that God sends upon Egypt is darkness. This plague is particularly significant as it directly challenges Ra, the sun god, who was respected as the most powerful of all Egyptian deities. Exodus chapter 10 verses 21 through 23. God instructs Moses to stretch out his hand toward the sky, bringing darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness so thick it can be felt to the point that the Egyptians couldn't see anything. They couldn't even leave their houses because the darkness was so intense and frightening. For three days, the entire land of Egypt is engulfed in this profound darkness, while the Israelites have light in their dwellings. This distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites is critical. It not only demonstrates God's power over the most revered Egyptian god Ra, but also signifies God's favor and protection of the Israelites. The darkness that disabled Egypt is a symbol of the spiritual darkness and oppression under which the Egyptians live, while the light among the Israelites represents enlightenment and divine presence. By targeting Ra through this plague,